Hello and welcome to this video on social class and educational achievement internal factors. So far we have focused on external factors, so what is happening outside the education system. We must now move on to look at what is happening inside the education system itself and how different factors affect achievement. Firstly, we need to consider labelling. To label someone is to attach a meaning or definition to them. Teachers often label students based on stereotyped assumptions. Howard Becker looked at labelling in secondary schools and he interviewed 60 Chicago high school teachers and found that they judged pupils against the image of an ideal pupil. So in the teacher's minds, they have an idea of what they think the perfect or ideal pupil is, and they're measuring students as they meet them, as they interact with them, against that ideal. Work, conduct and appearance informed their judgment. Becker found that middle class students were closest to the ideal that the teachers had in their mind. Whereas working class students were further away from the ideal and were regarded or were regarded as badly behaved. Sikaral and Katsuse also looked at this issue and they studied American school counsellors and careers advisors and found that labelling can disadvantage working class students. Counsellors claimed to assess students' suitability to enter higher education on the basis of their academic ability. In reality, they were judging their suitability mainly on the grounds of their social class or race. This meant that the counsellors and careers advisors were telling white middle class students that they were perfectly capable and able to do well in higher education, whereas when they were interacting with, say, black Asian minority ethnic working class students, they would often say, have you thought about getting an apprenticeship or going straight into the world of work? So what we're seeing there is a sense of discrimination or at least a sense of prejudice against a certain group. In primary schools, Ray Rist looked at an American kindergarten or in the UK what we would refer to as a reception year. Teachers used information on student homes and backgrounds to separate them into different tables. So Rist found that teachers were looking at students or pupils' personal files, finding out where they lived, and in discerning whether or not that was a working class area or a middle class area. And then based on that uh, information, they would then seat the children in, on different tables. One table was known as the Tigers. These were the fastest learners who tended to be middle class or come from middle class areas. They were often seen as being neat and tidy and they received the most encouragement and support. So the teachers spent most of their time with the tigers. Two other groups were known as the cardinals and the clowns. These students tended to be working class. They were often given lower level work. When engaging in reading, they read as a group rather than as individuals and were given less opportunities to show their abilities. So once again, it would appear that working class students are being disadvantaged. Coming back to the UK for a moment, Sharp and Green studied Mapledean, a British primary school where children choose their activities and develop at their own pace. It's quite a radical, unusual school in that regard. It really gives the power to the children and allows them to decide what they're going to learn and when they're going to learn it. Middle-class children appeared ready to learn quicker and therefore received more attention from teachers. And the middle-class students were actually going up to the teachers and saying, I want to do some art, I want to do some maths, I want to do some reading. And the teachers were like, fantastic, and would help them with that. Whereas working-class children engaged in compensatory playtime until they were deemed ready and received less reading time and attention. So the working-class students or children weren't going up to the teachers perhaps quite as quickly, they were playing a little bit more in the sandpit or with the play-doh and then perhaps latterly they would then come and ask to do some reading or some learning about geography or history or whatever it may be but by the very nature of putting it off they received less time and attention from their teachers so again um, perhaps this is going to lead to underachievement amongst working class children. 
Next, we need to be aware of the self-fulfilling prophecy as it links closely to labeling. A prophecy is essentially a statement that says something is going to happen. When something is a self-fulfilling prophecy, this will mean that it's going to come true simply because the statement that it will come true has been made. In terms of what this means for education, it would work like this. It has three stages. Firstly, the teacher might label a pupil. So the teacher is going to say, you are a good pupil or you are a not so good pupil. And they may not communicate that straight away, but perhaps they've been measuring the student against that idea of the ideal pupil in their mind and found them either meeting the criteria or failing to meet the criteria. And so they label them. Next, the teacher treats the pupil according to the label they have placed upon them. So if they've decided that this student meets the criteria of being an ideal pupil, they start to behave very warmly towards them, spend more time with them, give them encouragement and support. Whereas if they measure the student against the ideal pupil and find them wanting, they may say, oh, this student's going to be lazy, it's not going to be very academic, it's going to be a waste of time, and therefore spends less time with them, and will probably discipline them more. Finally, the pupil internalizes the label, even though the label may not be explicitly stated. So the teacher might not say you're a good pupil, you're a bad pupil. They may sort of implicitly make it part of the way they view themselves. They internalize the label and they start to think, oh, I'm not a very good pupil or, oh, I'm one of the top of the class. And so once they begin to act that way, it comes true. And so the self-fulfilling prophecy is complete. Teachers can create self-fulfilling prophecies. Studies show what teachers believe students achieve. And that's a nice little phrase that you may want to remember. could be quite useful in an exam scenario. Streaming is an extreme and institutionalized form of labeling. And you may well have been streamed yourself in secondary school. This is putting all pupils of similar ability into the same class or stream. So for example, bright or clever or intelligent pupils will be in the top streams, whereas the thick or unintelligent or less clever pupils may be placed in the bottom streams. And often in particular in secondary schools, in year seven when students first arrive, students will engage in a set of exams, a set of tests, and the streams will be decided based on those. Sometimes students move up and down the streams over the space of the five years they're at school, but often many will stay in the stream that they are set in from year seven. Other schools might use SATS results in order to stream. Colin Lacey stated this, a way of separating sheep from goats and educating them separately. This was his description of streaming. Douglas found that IQ of those in the bottom stream actually fell over time, whilst in the top set it increased. So an IQ test is supposed to be a test of innate intelligence, so intelligence that you're born with. If ever you've had the opportunity to undertake the 11 plus, the 11 plus is an IQ test. What's interesting in terms of what Douglas has found here is that once a student is streamed, their IQ seems to change based on whether or not they've been placed in the top or bottom stream. Those in lower streams were denied access to the same curriculum. So, for example, they're not put in for the higher level exams. And even today, that's still an issue. If you think about how GCSEs work, some papers, such as the science and maths papers, there are higher papers, intermediate papers, and foundation papers. And depending on what stream you are in, you may be placed in one of those papers. And if you are in, say, the foundation paper, you may find that the highest grade you can achieve is a grade C, whereas for intermediate, it may be a grade B. So you are being limited in a sense. Next, we need to think about pupil subcultures. This is a group of pupils who share similar values. Often, pupil subcultures form as a response to teacher labeling and streaming. The question for us is how do subcultures develop? Well, Firstly, we need to think about the process of differentiation, the process by which a teacher categorizes pupils. So again, measuring students against the idea a teacher has in their mind of what an ideal pupil is, and then thinking about, is the student able or not? And if they're able, they'll be considered high status. If they're not able, they may be considered low status. This could lead to polarization, a process by which students respond to streaming, moving towards a pole. So if we think about the North Pole and the South Pole, how they're the complete opposites of each other, or extreme. 
and this leads to the creation of pro-school or anti-school subcultures. So once the students have been differentiated, placed in different streams, they may begin to form two subcultures in the top streams, that's those are supposed to, most likely to be pro-school subcultures. In the bottom streams, those are more likely to be anti-school subcultures. Sociologists identified two people's subcultures prevalent in schools. Once again, the pro-school subculture and the anti-school subculture. You may want to pause the video for a moment now and complete this task and to consider before you turn the slide what constitutes the pro-school and anti-school subculture. So think about this. What type of student would fit in each? How do these students behave, do you think? How might they gain status within that subculture? And how might teachers view these students? So you may want to draw out these columns, have a go at this task, give yourself about five minutes before continuing with the video. In the pro-school subculture, students are in the highest streams. They tend to be middle class. They're more committed to the values of the school. They gain status in the subculture through acting in an approved manner and through academic achievement by getting the top grades. In the anti-school subculture, however, students tend to be from the lower streams. They are often working class. They tend to have low self-esteem and low self-worth, and so their confidence is often very low. The label of failure pushes the student or students to find alternative methods to gain status. So they don't feel they can gain status in their subculture simply by getting the top grades, and so they've got to find a different way. And so they may turn upside down or engage in value inversion, the school's values. So if the school's values are being punctual, working hard and being obedient, they may purposely be late, they may purposely not do their work, they may purposely defy their teachers. Students seek to gain approval from their anti-school peers. So whereas in a pro-school subculture, yes, they want their friends to like them, but they also want approval from the teachers. In an anti-school subculture, they want to gain approval from their peers. And they may do this by being cheeky, by truanting, i.e. not turning up to school, by not doing homework, by being disruptive, perhaps even by engaging in anti-social behaviours such as smoking, drinking, taking drugs and stealing, amongst other things. This solves the status issue, but turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure. The behaviour pattern is a commitment to educational failure. So it solves the status issue. The students want to gain status somehow, can't do it the legitimate way, so they do it in an illegitimate way, but it leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy of educational failure. We find examples in studies by Lacey and Hargreaves. Students who had performed well in primary school up to the 11 plus where there was no streaming they often joined anti-school subcultures and failed when at secondary school they were streamed so in a primary school there was no streaming these students might do very well they get to secondary school they get streamed and now if they're placed in the bottom group they don't do so well Stephen Ball was interested in the abolition of streaming and he looked at a comp comprehensive school known as Beachside which was abolishing streaming or going through the process of doing so. And instead, it introduced mixed ability groups. As a result, pupil polarisation, and so students' subcultures also, disappeared, which appears to be a positive. However, teacher labelling persisted, leading to self-fulfilling prophecies, whereby the middle class students outperformed the working class students. So very little changed. Interestingly, the trend in the UK has been towards more streaming. It's actually a very popular policy. Many schools follow it. Many parents who believe that their children are hardworking and good students often think that streaming is a good thing. And in particular, often their, students, their children are in the top streams, whereas the parents of children who are in the lower streams often feel that they have no power to challenge it. So there's very little they can do. So nothing changes. We also see that there's been an increase in the variety of school types and therefore curriculums where the middle classes often take on more academic studies whilst in school, and the working classes take on more vocational or hands-on manual studies. Peter Woods identified a variety of pupil responses to streaming and labelling. The pro and anti-school subculture type is not the only student response, he argued, and 
labeling streaming can provoke and produce a range of different reactions because human beings are very varied creatures. Once again, you may want to pause the video and consider this question. How else might students react besides joining the extremes of the pro-school and anti-school subculture? So think about your time in secondary school. Were you one of, part of one of these subcultures? Um, perhaps you didn't realize you were, but now you look back on it and you realize that that was the case. Or did you engage in some other response to teacher labeling and streaming? You know, were you aware of any teachers engaging in labeling? Were you aware of the effects of streaming? Did you have friends in other streams who may have responded differently? Take a moment now. Peter Wood suggested a range of different responses. Firstly, he identified in his study ingratiation. This is where students would seek to be the teacher's pet. So they might look to talk to the teachers before and after lessons. They may even buy them presents at Christmas and this sort of thing with a view to try and become friendly with the teachers in the hope that that will mean they get better grades or that they're treated more favorably. Next, ritualism, going through the motions, staying out of trouble. These are the students who sort of very quietly turn up to school, do what's asked of them, hand in their homework, they never work supremely hard, they never completely underachieve, they're very middling and often quietly ignored. So for them, education is a ritual, something just to be endured. Next, retreatism. This is where students often retreat into themselves. They may engage in daydreaming rather, rather than engaging in the actual activities in the classes or in the homeworks. And they may sometimes simply just muck around in lessons, once again, as a way of almost distracting themselves and retreating into themselves or into their peer group rather than engaging in the activities. Finally, rebellion. This is outright rejection of everything school stands for. These students may actively go out of their way to disrupt lessons, to upset teachers, to upset other students, to prevent learning. And often these are the students which are identified and disciplined quite harshly. What Peter Woods found interesting was that there was no commitment to any of these responses uh, necessary by the students. That is to say that students may move between different responses. So in some lessons, they may engage in ingratiation because they really like the teacher, whereas in other lessons, students may engage in rebellion because they really dislike the teacher. Or because they enjoy the actual learning, they may quietly go through it while disliking the teacher, whereas another lesson, because they hate the learning but they enjoy the teacher, they may engage in, I don't know, retreatism, who knows. There are, however, some problems with labeling theory, in so much as that the overarching aim or claim here is that underachievement is caused by teacher labeling, leading to a self-fulfilling prophecy, leads to students joining anti-school student subcultures and thus guaranteeing failure. There's also the argument that schools perpetuate class inequalities and that schools are not neutral. There are some problems with this theory and you may want to pause again now and consider what problems might there be. Well, arguably, this theory is too deterministic. It sort of seems to state that students' destinies are written the moment they turn up in school and teachers label them, that they can't change it, they can't overcome problems, when in reality we know that's the case. No one is necessarily destined to fail. Some indeed turn it around. There are situations where we have students who start off very poorly, but then work much harder towards the end of the year or towards the end of their time in a institution and get really good grades. But also the opposite is true. You get some students who perhaps do really well at first and try really hard, but for whatever reason get turned off and no longer enjoy it and no longer engage, and then they might fail later on. Marxists would also argue that there is a failure here to account for wider structures of power, and they blame teachers without asking why the teachers label. And we need to think about the reality that most teachers are probably going to be middle class, they're going to be university educated, um, they're going to use the elaborated code, and perhaps in many ways they are part of a establishment or a machine which is seeking to uphold the status quo. That's it. Thank you very much.